guest today is Paul McDonald. He is a retired professor emeritus from psychology at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, specialist in autism spectrum disorder, and has a musical side to him too, which we'll explore later on in the show. Welcome. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> um, could we start with your professional career or former career in autism? And actually, you sit on a national board now. There was recent media coverage oh, yeah. that you uh, sit somewhere high up in the structure for autism. Well, not really. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a, a, a consultant with Autism Canada, okay. which is a real pleasure to be part of that organization, actually. I enjoy it. Yeah. Can you help the audience right from the start have an appreciation for the work you do in autism? We know it through how the media will portray moments um, when that comes into the public fray, and maybe that that's not as deep an understanding as we could hmm. benefit from. I guess uh, you know I was a uh, I was uh, when I started doing clinical psychology in the really in the late eighties, uh, so that's a long time ago. Uh, when I think about it, uh, I mean I, I guess. Uh, at that point, I I was focusing on children. Uh, I was a child psychologist. Uh, uh, many of the uh, children that came to see me, uh, it turned out there was a very high instance of autism. So I became increasingly interested in autism as a diagnosis. And uh, so, um, and along the way, I met a lot of incredible parents, you know, who were struggling with the issues related to autism and helping their children to develop properly. And, uh, and I was so impressed, I think, with some of the parents that I met that I thought, you know, these people are very strong. They're really, they're really uh, doing everything they can. They're turning over every stone. They're working so hard. And so I kind of wanted to be part of that, uh, that effort, you know. And uh, so I got invited to do talks on autism and eventually uh, just started reading more about it, doing more work in the field. Uh, of course, I was seeing children clinically, so that, that helped as well mm -hmm. to inform what I was doing. And um, one of, But then, of course, what was really exciting at that point was that there was some research out there that really showed that autism was treatable to some extent and that there were effective methods for treating it, evidence-based methods that actually were available. And so I think I sort of felt like a lot of people don't know about this. And we have to make people aware of what is possible, what is available out there. Yep. So that's what that's what I was doing. COVID. Can you um, give us a definition or a description of autism? Um, autism is a developmental disorder and uh, probably uh, mostly genetic in origin. Uh, and uh, it uh, really is a disorder that affects three areas of functioning, particularly uh, uh, social development. Uh, it also, though, related to that, I guess, is, is, is communication skills. So um, in some cases, at one extreme, you might have a, a child who has no language at all and does, literally doesn't speak to a child who has language and probably fairly good vocabulary, but has a tremendous difficulty with conversation, you know, so it, it runs that whole gamut. Uh, so that's communication. Uh, the social part is, of course, related to that, and there's a real difficulty for many individuals on the spectrum in engaging in reciprocal interactions, you know, with, with people. So, again, a conversation is the prototypical social situation. We're having a conversation right now. And probably many people with, uh, with, on the autism spectrum would find this type of face-to-face, -face, uh, open-ended conversation to be very difficult. A more structured conversation would be okay, but, but for them that would be a challenge, I think. And uh, then the third sort of component is, um, and probably it's partly related to the, the presence of the social issues, is that there's a preference for sameness, there's a preference for, the, there's a tendency to be rigid, there's a tendency to engage in sort of repetitive behaviors of one sort or another, or to find uh, fascination in particular aspects of the sensory environment, uh, which kind of lock them into uh, repetitively uh, stimulating themselves with those kinds of things. Like you could see a child sitting on a playground and instead of playing with 
the materials are in the playground, the child is sifting sand repeatedly and doing this over and over again. So that repetitive behavior is, is sort of the background in, in, the, in the diagnosis, I think. When you gave the image of sifting the sand, um, I want it to be light but in depth at the same time. With uh, Would that be like Rain Man? In the movie Rain Man, where the match matches fall down, and he knows the number of the matches right away because it appears whole. Yeah. And, but then to communicate it's sort of another challenge, and uh, that's a Hollywood movie and all. Yeah. But that focus on what they might be seeing might be ten times more powerful than what you know. Well, we're just sifting Santa or anything. Maybe they're catching every grain as it goes whistling. It's a, that is a possibility, I suppose. <laughs> but but uh, typically, yeah, I suppose that's possible. Uh, Typically, we don't see a lot of examples of this sort of incredible uh, sort of skill like that that Rain Man showed. I mean, I, I have seen, actually, uh, some individuals on the spectrum who did have those kinds of unique skills, but that's pretty rare. That's yeah. not typical. A, a neighbor yeah. of mine a few years ago um, had a son, have a son, yeah. and uh, his thing, when the Zellers was still open in Fredericton on the north side, um, he would count the lights. Okay. And and would know which ones were out from which the last right. time. Yeah, yeah, um, another friend, um, the dad had uh, um, hockey cards going back yeah. 20 or 30 years and would have fun playing with his son at nighttime, playing them out. Absolutely. But they had to be a particular way. Absolutely. And yeah. and would remember every card. In and that, that's rigid. They had to be a particular way. And if you disturbed that, they'd, he'd probably be upset with you about <laughs> that. <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. I guess I was trying to slide to, there's a talent set buried in that struggle to communicate um, mm -hmm. what's going on. Well, the thing is, is that individuals on the autism spectrum uh, may have developmental uh, limitations in, in cognition, in, in, in thinking, uh, but they may not, too. So we have many who are extremely bright, uh, but, but there's a lot in the middle of the range, too. So just like we have in in people who don't have a diagnosis, then you know you have a range of abilities. However, there is a fairly high percentage that would have significant impairments intellectually, and so we have to keep that in mind too. And so the the in a way the, but all of the there are challenges all along the spectrum. There are different challenges along the spectrum, but there are definitely challenges all along the spectrum. I know a lot of normal or typical people that would fit. <laughs> Those, oh, yes. You know, because yeah. whenever we put that lens on it, they say, "Well, yeah, we could say that about society in general. We've we've, mm -hmm. we've got some challenges we need to overcome." So, it just sets the. I think I think we're all uh, we're all challenged in ways. You know, we all yeah. have r r rigid behaviors. We all have have these things. It's just that in, in the person on the diagnosis, they have enough of them that it makes it may interfere with their life in some way. It yeah. may make it difficult for them to navigate through the social world. Yeah, you know, which then sets up how how we work with this mm -hmm. and how we help others work with this, which is maybe right. the ABBA program or something else. ABA, yeah. Applied, applied, applied behavior analysis. Yes. Yeah. So can you speak a bit to the tools that are available now and how much they've evolved so that we can build bridges to reach? Yeah, I think uh, applied behavior analysis is, uh, is a wonderful sort of evidence-based way to go about treating uh, not only autism but many other issues as well because basically what applied behavior analysis is is a way to teach people skills. And uh, so many of the individuals on the autism spectrum, the problem is because of the autism, their rate of learning is lower than it would be in a typical person. And so the point of applied behavior analysis is to optimize the learning that they do. You know? And so the, the, the idea is that uh, if we can design a learning situation in which that child is gonna be learning at a rate that is somewhat comparable to what a typical child would learn, then we're really going to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. If you kind of imagine that uh, your typical child, without any effort at all, is learning constantly throughout the day, and I mean, really, this is actually true. If you look at the number of interactions that a typical child has with its environment in which they have the chance, opportunity to learn something, it's probably happening every hour of the day. And in contrast, the child on the spectrum is not actually doing that. That when we watch them and observe them, we see that a lot of their repetitive behaviors lock them into one thing and they're doing this for a long period of time or they're doing nothing at all. Hmm. Or the interactions they're having are not productive interactions. They may be ones that they're, it's creating a problem for them. They may be getting into a temper tantrum. 
uh, which results in a prolonged temper tantrum, which results in them having a, a negative interaction with, uh, say, the parents, you know. So they're not really learning the kinds of things that we want them to, and they're certainly not learning at the rate we would like to see that child learn. So in the course of a week, uh, you've got um, how many hours? I don't know, 190 hours a week or something like that. Uh, your typical child is probably learning most of those hours are being used. Some, obviously, they're asleep for some of them, so yeah. when they're awake, they're actually learning. And your typical child on the spectrum is probably not learning for a lot of those. Some vary, of course, depending on the child. Mm. But so the goal of intervention, I think, from my perspective, is to increase the rate of learning, basically. And that's what applied behavior analysis has effectively done. So, for instance, in the original research, they uh, happen to choose 40 hours a week of therapy, if you want to call it. Now, actually, what that really was is 40 hours a week with a teacher, basically. Yeah. It's really what it boils down to. Yeah. And, uh, but the teacher was trained. The teacher was following a program. The teacher was uh, optimizing the learning for those children while they were with them. And uh, what they found in the research, this was back in 1987, was done by Dr. Ivar Lovas at the University of California, Los Angeles. And what Lovas found was that uh, uh, if you can provide a consistent and optimal learning environment, that a significant number of the children who went through the program uh, became almost indistinguishable from typical children. Not totally, but they came very close to it. Certainly, uh, they made significant gains in intellectual development, significant gains in adaptive development, and their social skills dramatically improved. So the kind of statistic that uh, Lovas was quoting in, in, his, well, in the research is that roughly about 40 to 45 percent of the children became indistinguishable from a typical child. And the others, you know, would, would get more or less, they come up with different amounts of yep. improvement, but they were all doing doing better. There were some that showed very little responsiveness to the treatment, but that was a very small number. So that research has been repeated and replicated many times over uh, in many different ways, in many different sort of environments and laboratories around the world. And generally, uh, it has been has been confirmed that that can actually take place. So. That's the good news. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's great news yeah, yeah. that we have uh, an intervention that can be extremely effective and uh, under ideal conditions. The trick is, of course, is to create those ideal conditions. The trick is to to have uh, a way to provide the services. You know, and that of course costs money, and uh, and uh, so there are issues there. Yeah. But uh, in New Brunswick, we've done reasonably well. You know, with this and. Uh, are there alternative treatments? There's, you know, there, there, there are, mm -hmm. um, but uh, most of the alternative treatments are not evidence-based. Uh, there are many things that are held out to the public as a treatment. Uh, I think a lot of them are scams, frankly. Mm -hmm. There are a number of things out there that are, uh, are uh, in fact, I would say in the, in the field of autism, there's sort of like a, uh, uh, a new fad treatment is available almost every week we hear something so but beyond that there are um, there are uh, developmental approaches there are uh, some uh, speeches involving uh, language and communication which are, are uh, I think effective I, in some sense I sort of see all of these things as merging together that, that they're all aiming at a lot of the same things really but, do you have any um, personal stories you might share of a family you worked with or a person you worked with that would um, kind of give it an example of, of the structure you've now taught us and, and built for us? Hmm. That we have this tool, it's been well documented, it's, it's been proven to work. Mm -hmm. It does take ideal conditions. New Brunswick will have its particular challenges, which we'll get into in, in a bit. Mm -hmm. But it would be nice to hear if uh, he had some hands on, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, the human. Face of it, no names, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, sure, of course. No, uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, as I say, the thing we talk about the autism spectrum. So there is, of course, a spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, uh, symptoms, uh, severity of symptoms. We see 
individuals who uh, really have very little um, skill at all, uh, so quite impaired in terms of their development. On the other side, we have individuals who are um, we typically used to refer to them as Asperger's, uh, high-functioning autism. These are individuals who may get university degrees, mm -hmm. but they still have some of the characteristics, the social anxiety, they have uh, some of the repetitive rigid behaviors, you know. So you have a whole a whole spectrum in there. Um, I don't know, I, I can think of a, lot, a number of, uh, of clients that I worked with that were particularly uh, interesting to me. Uh, one that I can think of is a young girl who, who came for assessment to me uh, years ago, and she was very, very passive, and that's one of the expressions of autism. In her case, she was passive in the sense that she didn't respond to me when I talked to her. She, she sat in the corner. She didn't want to play with toys. She just she wasn't upset particularly. She was just disinterested in, in me, disinterested in the world around her, um, not responding, and clearly not learning. In that situation. So she went, uh, we did the assessment, we, we calculated the um, scores on the developmental tests that we had, and she was functioning pretty low. And uh, by all accounts, uh, looking at, at the, uh, the history provided by the parents, you know, you could see that uh, she, she was not able to accomplish uh, much in terms of adaptive skills in the real world. Um, she, after the uh, assessment and the diagnosis, uh, she entered into the Autism Intervention Services program that we have in New Brunswick. And uh, this provides 20 hours a week of applied behavior analysis uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, so she was in that and she I think at the time that I saw her initially, I think she was probably around two years of age, two to maybe two and a half. And so she went into the intervention program and I didn't see her for quite a while, but I guess about, <clears throat> actually we were making a film, I think, about uh, how to teach people, uh, how to train people in applied behavior analysis techniques and uh, uh, her family volunteered to be subjects in the film, so they came in for that. And it was really interesting because when she came, she she had developed a language. She uh, she was now talking. Uh, she was very robotic, I would say, and uh, uh, and 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 was limited in what she could say. But but she had language, and this seemed to me to be fantastic. You know, uh, she. Um, uh, she was able to um, sit and, and interact with a therapist and uh, to engage in a variety of tasks, uh, could, could answer questions, and uh, this was pretty good. Anyway, that, I saw her then, and then I think about a year later, <clears throat> maybe it was about a year later, a year and a half later, she came back for a follow-up assessment. Then when she came back, she showed up at the door of my office, you know, and she had a smile on her face, which was unbelievable. I'd never seen her do that, you know. Uh, she came in, she said, where should I hang my coat? I was like, oh my, we have really gone somewhere with this job. Where am I going to hang my coat? I was thrilled. Well, you can just hang your coat right there, you know. <laughs> she was just sweet. And then she said, well, you know, what are we going to play? And I said, okay, well, let's go in, let's go play. And so we went into the room we had and we a lot of toys and things. She said I want, she wanted to play taxi, and uh, she said uh, I'll be the driver. And you, and she was telling me how we're going to play this game. Um, but and we're we're so we were in the taxi and we're driving along. And she says, "Would you like some music?" He clicks the radio. And she, the point is, she was engaging in pretend play. You know, it's she powerful. was. It was just powerful, yeah. And and it was the fluidity, and and the spontaneity, of her behavior that day that really thrilled me, you know, that that was what was different. I didn't, at the halfway point, when I had seen her a year and a half before that, she hadn't quite got there. She had developed a lot of the basic skills, but she hadn't quite made the, the grade to that next level. But it was at that point that I saw her that last day, I thought, you know, she's made it. You know, she's, as, she's getting very close to what you'd expect for a typical child of that age, you know. So that was pretty exciting, you know. It's, that's terrific. It also sounds like... Um, <clears throat> she gained a measure of confidence. 
Yes, that's really true. Yeah, and her social confidence. And that was the thing, you know, she really was, she had picked up how to do social stuff, you know, how to, how to, how to talk to me, you know, where should I hang my coat, you know, would you like some music? You know, isn't that amazing, you know? Yes. So that's, and I think that's what a lot of us feel when we work in this field, that when you have an intervention technique that you use and it works, and you see that child learning, that is pretty darn exciting. Mm. We love that. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Which then gets to the next step is that, so we have the tools and we have some of the people. Mm -hmm. So um, in your view, how is New Brunswick doing with application implementation of this program? I'm um, in doing some of the homework for the show. There's some newspaper articles if people wanted to Google Paul McDonald, they'll find um, a couple in the past year or so, mm -hmm. which ties to um, the turn towards government. We have this tool, and we have an inclusion strategy to some degree mm -hmm. in the province, mm -hmm. um, but it's still not firing in all cylinders. And government, probably uh, in their perspective, they get all these requests from so many different areas, they'll kind of zero everybody out and say everybody's asking for the same thing. Right. I've always wanted to flip the paradigm around because um, mm. that's one of we don't have enough, we don't have enough, rather than we've got everything we need. Right. right. We yeah. just need to put it together a different yeah. way. So past guests on the show um, have spoken to, like Karen Lake, for example, she knows we could create 3,000 jobs tomorrow for in-home care <laughs> for seniors, yeah, yeah. which would then have a net benefit for the hospitals and for mm -hmm. senior care homes by keeping people in their home longer. Right, right. But it might be perceived by the government that here's somebody else thinking they've got the solution to mm -hmm. a problem and it's going to cost money, mm -hmm. rather than putting it through the whole analysis yes. to see what happens at the end. You, you do need to people. do that. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm <clears> assuming <throat> that you might have a similar experience model mm -hmm. solution. Can well, you? well, there are um, there have been a number of cost benefit studies done uh, involving autism treatment, and consistently those studies have shown that there are significant savings over the lifetime of an individual if you invest in in early intervention uh, for autism. In fact, all autism services produce a net benefit. And that actually reduces the amount of money the taxpayers ultimately pay. However, there is an upfront cost. You have to you have to invest in it in the beginning to get the system up and running, and that costs a significant amount of money. And then as time goes on, you reap the benefits down the road. And uh, but there are some outstanding studies that have been done in this area, and 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 they're they're really excellent studies. There was one done at the. Um, uh, at the Hospice for Sick Children in Toronto uh, several years ago, which uh, showed that typically, if you look at do doing the intervention as opposed to not doing the intervention, you would save over the course of an individual's life approximately $800,000, roughly, for taxpayers per person. Uh, so, Looking at that, uh, and, and there have been studies in the, in the United States that have done this as well. There's, uh, there's several other in, 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 in the States, and, and, and one other one I can think of in Canada as well that have, have, have demonstrated this. So it's, it's, I think, fairly well documented that this is a good investment, that it's worth spending the money like this. So in the case of New Brunswick, I mean, we have, uh, I, I'm really, I'm really proud of the province, you know, because I think, I think we've actually done pretty darn good job, you know. I mean, uh, I, we're, we're not there. I mean, obviously, there's a lot that needs to be done. But, but if you look at other jurisdictions, I think we're ahead of the game in many, compared to some of the other provinces. And that's, that's exciting, I think, and satisfying. Um, early intervention, the preschool intervention program, we have a comprehensive early intervention program in the, problem, in the province. It's wonderful because access is so good. So when a child is diagnosed within several months, they're in a program. If you contrast that to the province of Ontario, you'll see a dramatic difference where there is huge wait times to get into programs in Ontario, unless they've changed it very recently, but certainly that was the case. Um, and so, um, and in some of the other provinces, there's virtually no services. So uh, what we have here at the early intervention stage is very good, and I think it's very worth doing because it's actually producing good outcomes, and it's really working. Um, 
So, uh, and, and it's good because, I mean, a, a, say a child is picked up uh, around 18 months to 24 months, which is not unusual in terms of diagnosis, and then um, within several months they're into a program, and they can stay in that program until they enter into kindergarten. So that program is ABA-based, it's evidence-based. The individuals who are delivering the treatment is a company called Autism Intervention Services. Uh, and uh, the government provides the funding and the, uh, the company provides the services. And they have, they're highly trained. They have uh, individuals who run it who have, are certified behavior analysts. So they've gone through, uh, they're all uh, typically either speech language pathologists or occupational therapists or psychologists who have gone the extra mile and done the extra training to become certified behavior analysts, which is, <clears throat> which is great. And uh, <clears throat> so they have, a, they have uh, the qualifications to do the job. And, and the intervention programs that we've observed, that we see, are, seem to be working extremely well. But after you leave, leave <clears throat> the preschool level, children go into the school. Now, a few years ago, um, the Department of Education uh, took over the preschool program. It was in Department of Social Services, but, but in order to... Uh, make things work more fluidly, they put it all into education, which seems to have worked. I think it's, 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 it seems like a good idea because uh, you have one department then that's in charge. And, and really, the intervention program really is education. It's really what it is. That's what you're doing. You know? So it makes a lot of sense. And um, But the Department of Education has done a really cool thing. Uh, what they've done is developed uh, an online training program for teachers, for educational assistants, uh, and also for the teachers. And the, this is a really uh, excellent online training tool. And it has several levels to it. Um, there's a practicum for uh, if you wish to do it, uh, which is incredibly important, I think, in this field. And uh, um, they, um, uh, uh, this, this, this online program is seen as an excellent program not only by us here in the province but also by the other Atlantic provinces. So all of the other Atlantic provinces have adopted our program that was made here in New Brunswick, which is kind of nice to hear. And uh, so they're using it to varying degrees, but I know that around the Atlantic provinces typically they're enrolling about a thousand teachers a year. So the it, within the field of education in the schools, the level of understanding of how to teach children with autism is dramatically improving, I think, as time goes along. And uh, we're getting teachers with more and more education. And many of them are becoming certified behavior analysts. But certainly resource teachers are doing that. And uh, so, so this is all very encouraging. How long has this been going on? I would say that program's been there maybe not very long, uh, about three years. Yeah, about three years, I think, now. Three One of the themes that yeah. consistently comes up, especially when <clears throat> conversations with politicians, yeah. is asking the politician, can you live with a 20-year solution to your four-year election cycle? Mm. Because quite often policies are driven by the four-year election cycle. Absolutely. And we're in yeah. the throes of that right now in New Brunswick. But what you just mapped out, if that was allowed to just keep doing what it's doing, mm. and let it keep growing the way it's growing, three mm. years old to five years old to 10 years old to 20, yeah. it would have a significant impact um, Absolutely. all, and it all will. through. Yeah, I think it will. Yeah. So do you think it'll be <clears throat> left alone, or can this become an example where maybe we can let the political mindset recognize that your role is governance, not power, mm. and some things are left to go full fruition. Yeah, yeah. I certainly, well, I guess I just hope so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I, I see the, you know, the, the, this, this type of online training as, as a practical way to go about uh, increasing the critical thinking level of people who work with people with autism, you know, they understand yeah. the situation so much better. And um, <clears throat> it's not the, the only the final solution, necessarily, but it's certainly uh, an excellent, excellent effort. So I think it's really good that we've done that. I think this is this is why I'm very. This is the the part that I'm really happy about in New Brunswick that we've accomplished. You know, we need to do more, obviously, 
So for instance, in the preschool program, probably what we need is more hours of intervention for some of the children. So we tend to have, have a 20 hour intervention number. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets 20 hours, but everybody doesn't need 20 hours. Some people need more, some need less, you know. So I mean, it, it would make sense to have more flexibility and to uh, titrate the intervention to suit the individual, which I think it brings up an, an important issue, which is that, uh, you know, it, it, the field of autism is unique in that the individuals are unique and the kind of intervention that each individual needs is unique. And when we design a program for a child on the spectrum, we have to really not just give them a generic program, we have to actually figure out, well, what are the, what are the, the top three things this particular child needs to learn right now? And that's what we need to teach them. And that will be different from another child and another child. And so this is where the classroom becomes a bit of an obstruction because in a classroom, it typically, the only point is you have a teacher walk in and there's 20 kids there and, and the teacher teaches 20 of them the same stuff. Well, that doesn't work. That's, that's good enough maybe for some of your typical kids, but it isn't necessarily good enough for children on the spectrum. We really need to say that this, this boy or this girl needs a particular program and we need to figure out what are the uh, target behaviors that we should be identifying and then how are we going to teach those target behaviors to that child because that's the uh, the way it works so there that's where the you know the, the challenges i think in a in a system which is delivering sort of one shoe fits all uh approach to uh, uh, you know, to designing it in, in, at the one-on-one -on -one level, which is really what you need for autism. Uh, however, you know, I mean, I, I'm saying that, I mean, I realize, I recognize that the, the, the schools are trying their best. I mean, they do try very hard, and the teachers are, are really t trying to, to tailor programs so that the child with any kind of a disability is, is, is getting what they need. Obviously, though, they, they are challenged to do that. I think, yeah. Well, what you're mapping out about the tailor-made program for each um, individual student in the ABA program, but in a classroom structure, mm. in some ways reminds me of coaching. Um, mm -hmm. You can have a team, and you've got 50 athletes on a football team, mm -hmm. and every one of them comes with a certain skill set. Yeah. And somehow you have to mold them in, into a team, but each of them, you know, some need to work on their footing, some need to work on understanding the play. Right. <laughs> some right. need to know where they fit into the pattern, because when you come from X's and O's on the board to being on the field, yeah. it doesn't at all doesn't <laughs> look translate. the same. Yeah, yeah for know? sure. Yeah. So yeah. it's all the same learning challenges, yeah. socialization challenges. And it's a wandering thought, but would the ABA program, eh, I know it's geared for uh, autistic youth, but there has to be some elements in the teaching of it that mm -hmm. would also apply to the whole class. Oh, yeah. Oh, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm just riffing a bit, but wouldn't it be interesting mm -hmm. if teachers were using some of that playful, adaptive structure while trying to get 20 students to a certain level in comprehension of mathematics or a certain level of skill set in languages? Mm -hmm. it sort of integrate the other way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, right, sense. yeah, reverse integration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, sometimes our language gets in the way of, of where we're trying to go because we tend to put things in labels and boxes. That's right. For yeah. the sake of getting there, trying to get mm. some understanding to yeah. it. So there's a good intent. Yeah, absolutely. But then it stops at a certain point where we, we can't get it to, to yeah, fit. So right. it needs a new language sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Break yeah. It through. Yeah, the... Um, uh, I, I don't know. The um, uh, see, uh, applied behavior analysis is sort of designed um, to optimize the learning. So it targets things like, for instance, what, what you would do if you're actually doing this. You identify a skill you want this child to learn, and then you set up uh, opportunities to to learn, and you provide motivation. You, you spend a lot of time working on how to get this child motivated to actually want to learn. You know, basically. So that's a key thing. So to some extent, those principles do apply to a whole classroom. And I don't think, you, I, I still don't think you can deviate from the, from the uh, role of, uh, or from the, the, the and, and you, you're never going to get back to a point where you, the classroom is all getting the same thing, even if it was ABA. <laughs> it wouldn't necessarily work because you still need to identify the, the, the skills that that child with autism need to learn are really substantively different than the skills that the other children need to learn. 
probably. And yes. even if even when they're at the same level, sometimes that is the case. So you may have a very high functioning individual with Asperger's syndrome or what we call Asperger's syndrome because the, 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 the diagnostic labels have changed lately. Um, but uh, uh, that person still may have challenges that are not necessarily the same as the typical kid in the class. So that we have, that's the reality we have to kind of work around. But hmm. I, I get your point. I, I think that's a, an interesting idea. Yeah. You know, it was more for <laughs> the teachers and administrators than yeah. for you know. The well, in a sense, you know, it's interesting <laughs> if you see a well-run uh, class that is run on behavioral principles and that is uh, 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 really excellent. Uh, you see kids who are just learning incredibly well, and it has nothing to do with autism. It's just it's just good teaching. It's yes. just that essentially that's what it is. But um, I remember one day I went to uh, look at a school in, New in um, Massachusetts, and, uh, and it was a, a, a school that had 60 children with autism in it, which is really interesting because we don't have those here. <laughs> this is a private, private institute. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, one of the classrooms they had there was a kindergarten, and it was a reverse integrated kindergarten. And, uh, and, and of course, in that kindergarten, they had excellent teachers, they had speech language pathologists, they had occupational therapists, they had, they had really solid professionals in there, right? And so this was an amazing kindergarten class, right? And I was standing at the door watching the kids in that room and I said, I can't tell the difference between, the, because this is a reverse integrate, so there were typical kids there, right? So I couldn't tell the difference between the typical kids and the kids with autism. Mm -hmm. And one of the fathers of a typical kid said, he said, you know what, he said, this is the best kept secret in Boston. There's all these people, they won't bring their kid to this reverse integrated class, but look at this class, he says, it's phenomenal. It's yeah. so well run. It's so, these kids are all learning at such an active rate, and that's, that's what you want to get at, you know. It's that, it's the rate of learning that's so important, you know, to address in this whole issue. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that left to their own devices, your typical child with autism is going to learn at an extraordinarily slow rate. And what we're trying to do with our interventions is up that rate substantially. That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. If you'll indulge me in prep for this, um, I thought, gee, I wonder what um, you would think about this. So it's Oliver Sacks' book oh, yes, called I'm An Anthropologist. Certainly aware of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a section about Temple Grandin, and it ties to learning. So I put it here in prep, thinking maybe we get there, maybe we don't, mm. and we're here. Mm. So to read a little section, um, yeah. Temple Grandin asks, How do you think? She kept asking me, but she had no sense that she could draw, make blueprints until she was 28, when she met a draftsman and watched him drawing plants. I saw how he did it, she told me. I went and got exactly the same instruments and pencils he used, a 0.5 millimeter HB Pentel, and then I started pretending I was him. The drawing did itself. And when it was all done, I couldn't believe I'd done it. I didn't have to learn how to draw a design. I pretended I was David. I appropriated him, drawing and all. Hmm. Does that... Resonate? Yeah. Does that kind of make yeah. sense? Well, Temple Grandin is an amazing person. Bit of an exception. As we all know. But she communicated a yeah. shift in a perception yeah. and explained a process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, she's describing what she did, yeah. and, it, and it worked. And, and of course, uh, she is famous for her ability to design animal uh, handling equipment and that yeah. sort of thing, yeah, you know. And uh, and that was must have been her first her first go at it, I guess. I hadn't actually I hadn't read that particular quote. At least I don't remember it anyway. <laughs> but it's uh, it's really good. Yeah, isn't yeah. it? Because I thought, my goodness, this would pop up just before yeah. we're going to have our conversation. Yeah. And I thought, so she's explaining how she did it. Just what, out of curiosity, she's speaking in Moncton. Uh, I think very soon on the sixteenth or seventh. Yeah, I think it's sixteenth, maybe of March. Of March, and I think it's in 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 Moncton, uh, and. Uh, but she's she's a wonderful speaker. Uh, I've heard her many times, and uh, and uh, she she she's brilliant, and she really understands uh, the differences between autism and, and the typical world. And she's uh, she's very good at articulating that. I think. So, yeah, builds yeah. a bridge for us. So she builds a bridge. She builds it just better. like she did in that quote. And yeah. she she builds a bridge for yeah. us absolutely. So back to New Brunswick um, school system. Media, and even Nova Scotia right now, come to think 
of it because there's a kerfuffle going on between the government and the teachers union and it has to do with a particular study and I mm -hmm. think somewhere in their mm -hmm. inclusion is one of the right. themes that's getting banged out again. And it always seems like a tug of war instead yeah. of a dance. Yeah, exactly. That's a good, <laughs> good way to put it. Yeah. And it shouldn't be a tug of war. It should be a dance. Yeah. 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 The, the, um, and we've got something cooking here in New Brunswick, as, mm. you, as you've taught us. Mm. But media will talk about how uh, understaffed some of the schools are. Um, mm. They'll talk about the challenges that come up with uh, an integrated classroom with uh, five ability levels here and four over here and the teacher trying to cope with that. Yeah, um, absolutely. When it comes yeah. to teaching assistants, so, uh, I often hear about there's not enough hours. You're not mm -hmm. giving us enough hours, which then yeah. slides to budgets, which then yeah. slides yeah. to that we don't have enough culture. Yeah. Um, and you've lived right in the mm. intersection of a lot of that mm. for a while. Do you see ways out of that dynamic? Is there a different conversation we could be having that actually gets us over the hump? Um, yeah, they, I mean, it's been sort of uh, a perception that there's inclusion and then there's not inclusion, you know, and there, there has to be something sort of... I mean, you know, the thing about inclusion is that it's a philosophy, it's not a method. You know, it's, it's an ideal, it's what you want. It's what we all want. Uh, we want all of our people, children, to uh, be able to interact in the world to, to the greatest extent possible. You know, we, we want them to do as much as they can and go where they can go and that sort of thing. So we want to make the world as rich and as, as interesting and as diverse as we can possibly do. That's sort of what inclusion is about. But the question is, how do you do it? You know. Mm -hmm. It may be that you might have to start off with a more restricted environment in the beginning if you want to get that person to that, that state, to that end goal. Mm -hmm. But you can't necessarily start there, you know. So we have to start where we're at, where the child is at. And I think that, the phrase I would use is, uh, that's really important, is that I think every child deserves a meaningful education, you know. And it's not meaningful to take a child with severe impairments and put them into a class where they're doing uh, algebra, and, and the child has no clue what is going on in that environment or that world. Uh, so that child deserves to have something that's meaningful to that person at that age, at that time. You know, that's what we need to do. Yeah. So that's, again, I think applied behavior analysis is good because essentially what we do is we identify the target behaviors that are appropriate for this child right now. And we then go about figuring out, okay, how are we going to teach them? And we're going to get the job done. And, and so that's important, I think. But meaningful education is important, I think. Um, so, you know, uh, so I think, I think the goal of inclusion is, is, is absolutely wonderful, you know, of course. I remember when I first came to New Brunswick, and I was working with the, what was at that time called the Canadian Association for the Mentally Retarded, which is now the Association for Community Living, right? But... Um, at that time, um, I was sort of like just interested in helping out with the association, and they would send me out to visit families occasionally. And, uh, and often I would get to a home and there was a child there who wasn't going to school, who, who was isolated in the back part of the house. Good heavens, it was yeah. <laughs> horrific, you know. The child was never taken out yeah. in public and so on. So they're, they're not that long ago. The world was not as inclusive, for sure. And an individual like that had a very, very um, meager existence, in a sense. And so, you know, uh, it's really wonderful that, that we do have more inclusion, that we're getting there. But at the same time, we have to lose, not lose sight of the fact that we have to teach appropriately. We have to teach in ways that actually result in this child learning. You know, I think yeah. that's the key. In, in one of your quotes from some of the old news stories, yeah. was that, uh, I want to use the phrase center of excellence, but it seems to me somewhere one of the paragraphs, assuming you were quoted accurately, mm. um, was that we need centers that do that appropriate teaching for that phase in that student's career or life or learning curve. To then, you know, their integration point might come mm. at another spot down mm -hmm. the spectrum mm -hmm. rather than right away. Yeah. Um, and, and it's long, you know, it, this isn't new. It's, I'm curious to learn where the breakthrough would be. Yeah. There's always that dynamic about systemic change. Right. Um, having points of entry where something did shift, which is amazing. So inclusion does accomplish that. Mm -hmm. But now in practice, it's mm -hmm. found that we're not 
helping these people as best we could, right. which almost goes back to that center of excellence, which the Canadian Association of Community Living might say, well, now you're segregating them again. Mm. But mm. that segregation, in a way, is no different than any other segregation where you're putting a group of people together to help them to their mm. best ability. Mm. And their integration point's actually going to come over here, yeah. not, not here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So should we go to building, um, and as an aside, I've heard stories about not having enough equipment. Um, this is that that expensive in that school, but every school can have one of those um, machines or tools or resources. So should we be thinking about creating spots where, where they there's a congregation of skill sets, talent, mm. to help them through that window, and then they integrate different ways? Or does it um, need to be in the school system? And in, no, I think it needs to be in the school system. And if we're talking about the schools, yeah. specifically, uh, I mean, I, 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 and I think we're getting it. I think that's what we're doing, you know. That, uh, I think, I think it's, it's, we're not there yet totally, but clearly we're on the road. We're training people. It's all about training. Like the, the, I think the key here is that, is that, you know, you can have people that... Uh, want to help people with autism uh, learn, but they may not be very good at it. And we do know how to teach uh, uh, effectively, so that uh, the skills that we've selected uh, will that they will learn them as well as they possibly can. And so I think it's I think it's really important to uh, put the emphasis on training, uh, providing uh, ongoing training for teachers uh, for sure, and. Uh, I don't think we need to create separate centers necessarily. I, and I'm wondering if that particular quote was related to discussion about adult services. You know, I maybe think it was probably that, as opposed to with the schools themselves, yeah. and certainly with the preschool. Yeah. And it was riffing a bit with your Boston mm. story or your Massachusetts story. Oh yeah, because because yeah. that sounds like it's a center of excellence of some sort. It was, yeah, yeah, and and certainly they they do an amazing job, and they work with the schools. I mean, they, they you know and was, it's leave the leave the center and go back to the schools yeah. with support, yeah. and that can work very well. It certainly can work absolutely. So the small yeah. to be had. Yeah, and I think it's it's uh, it's probably the, the case that we can do this in the context of the schools, but I think we need the resources to do it, and I think it's a good investment. Mm -hmm. and again, I think it's. It is not, you know. It's it, again, you have to pay up front, but uh, but what you get out of that is you get you get a much more effective uh, um, system, and the products, the outcome for the individuals is so much better. You know? And and that storyline is very very similar to the housing first strategy, mm. um, where slowly we're coming around to a, inverting the pyramid. <laughs> yeah. And seeing if we spend the money here, the return is going to be magnified over there. For those that have the economic economy as more as their primary yeah. driver, absolutely. The, the counterbalance yeah. to the uh, economy or the financial argument is the soul argument. Mm -hmm. um, there's something special about all of this that nurtures the provincial soul mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's a form of caring mm -hmm. that works. As, absolutely, yeah, that's true. So, do you have a, a feel for that? Can you share? Because somewhere along your career, um, you're not just helping with cognitive skills and socialization mm -hmm. skills. Mm -hmm. There's something in that person's soul that's being mm. nurtured as well, mm -hmm. and that in turn nurtures the whole provincial soul. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, certainly, it, are you thinking about the individuals with autism themselves and everyone? I, I want to mush it yeah. all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So when you do something good, sure, you feel it. Yeah. So you don't need to analyze it uh, financially. You don't no, no, yeah, well, for sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, if you look at it from the perspective of families, I think we need to do that because if uh, if you have a family that have a child with, let's say, moderately uh, impaired level of of, uh, of autism, um, and they're going to have a lot of challenges uh, to meet. Uh, some of them are financial, some of them are social, some of them, you know, there's lots of challenges. Um, and, and so when we provide intervention, what we do is we enable that whole family to have a better life, a much better life, you know. And, I mean, little things like uh, we were, uh, I'm associated with Autism Connections Fredericton here. I'm on the board. And uh, anyway, one of the programs we had last summer, which was really good, was a bicycle riding program. And uh, so what we did is uh, we had an occupational therapist who was wonderful who uh, had a, a program she developed uh, to teach children. So we only had about six kids, I think, uh, come out for this. 
Uh, I know that several of the kids who came out uh, did learn to ride uh, as a result of this. And then the parents said, you know, this is really amazing because we could never go on a family outing on a bicycle before. We had to stay home or, they were, you know, their lives were limited. Now, all of a sudden, the child can ride the bike and they're actually able to go out on the trail and, and as a family. And it's just that kind of thing, you know, that is uh, liberating and, and so exciting, I think, to see. I, I love that, you know. Those kind of stories. So we need to, you know, it's a little kind of course that we're providing there. We're going to do that one again. It worked really well. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, maybe to, we have about 10 minutes left. Hmm. So maybe to take a turn in a different direction. Another okay. one of your hats is the Lansdowne House Concerts. Oh, yes. Now, actually, we could segue it with uh, Nurturing the Soul with music. Okay. Yeah. Be because yeah. the... Yeah. You know, the nature of music will reach yeah. everyone. So it, whether it's yeah. the autistic spectrum or the non-autistic spectrum. Absolutely. The way yeah. it resonates in, in our bones. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So um, Music is an amazing uh, experience. And, uh, yeah, and uh, my wife and I, Liz, uh, we, we really enjoy music. So that's why we've embraced this. <laughs> yeah. And, and quick intro for the audience. Lansdowne House Concerts uh, invites a musician into their home. About 50 people get to come, um, pay a nominal fee, and you have a very intimate setting at your house. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's great for the performer. It's great mm -hmm. for the audience. Supports local music scene. Yeah. So um, what's that like to have all the strangers <laughs> <laughs> come into your house? It's good. It's good. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're the kind of people who we don't want to have a mausoleum for a home. We want to have it open to people, you know, and we, we really uh, enjoy uh, uh, that kind of thing. We enjoy meeting the people that come to the concerts, but we also enjoy meeting the artists as well. And uh, it's just a win-win kind of thing, you know, because we, we, we get a lot out of it. I mean, we, we love music. We love the artists. We love to know about the music business. Uh, we... Uh, we like to see people enjoying themselves, and we and I, I guess you know one of the reasons why we did it was we were interested in listening to music in what we call a listening environment. Yes. So we wanted to be in a place that's sort of like the playhouse, you know, where you can actually hear the music. We want to be able to hear every word, every note. We want to see what the artist is doing with the instrument, you know, and so we want to we want to we want to. A lot of the artists, all of the music that we, all of the musicians that we have are singer songwriters. That is, they all write their songs. We don't do cover bands. Uh, not that we, we don't appreciate cover bands. We do. But but it's that we have to limit it somehow. We can yeah, and, and, only do and, so many. Yeah. So we, we thought our, our focus would be on, on the artists who actually write the music and perform it. You know, And uh, there's an enormous number of artists in Canada. It's amazing. We get, we get over 200 requests a year to perform at Lansdowne Concert Series. And, and how many um, events are you able to And we to were provide? able to hold, uh, well, we we're sort of aiming at one a month, but we've always gone over that limit, so it's sort of more like <laughs> two a month. So we're, we're probably around uh, 18 to 20 a year. Wow, out of um, 200 requests. Yeah, out of 200 requests. So, so you can see from that that we have to be limiting it in order to do that. But all of the artists who do write to us, almost all of them are excellent. You know, it's really impressive because we listen to them all. We, yeah. we, we listen to them and we decide. You know, is this somebody that a is the timing is right, or, or is the you know maybe in a few cases it might be the genre. You know, like sometimes we listen and we say, well, okay, that's good. It's good music, but it's not what we want to do. You know, yeah. and so we get to choose because we're running the concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was yeah. also knowing your audience a bit too, yeah. or your membership. Yes, it you is. Know? Yeah. You kind of know well, they might not be a good fit for our game. Yeah, we had a we had a a cappella group uh, last year, and we weren't sure whether we should go there, but we listened to them. We thought they were so fantastic. That was a four a four forty. Yeah. yeah, and they were marvelous. They were so good, and they uh, and and it was well worth having them. I mean, it was they were terrific. <laughs> yeah. So this also, and how many years? Sorry, we started that in February twenty eleven. Okay. And so we've done, in the first the first four years we were doing. Every time an artist came, we would do two weekend, two two concerts, with the artist. So they would get to do one night with us and one night at our my brother and sister in law's place, and so we would actually do two concerts. And the result of that is we got to over a hundred concerts fairly quickly. Uh, now uh, it's plateaued a little bit, but uh, we're um, we're around one hundred and fifty concerts in something like that. I think. Yeah. My goodness. 
that also puts you in touch in a very intimate way with the music scene mm. um, from a di very different door. Like yeah. hosts, there aren't many hosts right. for music. And um, the impression is that th there's a lot going on musically mm. in Atlantic Canada. Yeah, there is. Yeah, <laughs> There so, really is. Yeah. So can you share that perspective that mm. you have on that? Well, we go to the East Coast Music Awards usually, and, and we... Uh, we go there because it's fun to go, but but we also go because it's a good opportunity to hear new musicians, ones we, from the Atlantic provinces we haven't heard yet, you know, and uh, and yeah, I mean they're they're just there's a huge number of uh, incredible artists. I it amazes me because of the level of talent why these people are not more famous than they actually are, you know, it, it, they're just so darn good. And uh, they write such beautiful songs. They perform them so well. Not only did they do that, they're usually humorous and funny on stage. They're, you know, they're eloquent. They're, you know, uh, very entertaining and wonderful people. And, you know, by the way, they all they all they all stay with us, uh, stay overnight. Most of them do. And uh, unless, of course, they live in Fredericton. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, most of them stay with us. And and they're they've all been incredible guests. You know, uh, just wonderful people to uh, get to know. Um, but yeah, there's, there, I mean, I think in the Atlantic provinces, there's just a, a, a we, we have a very robust group of artists here who, um, are as good as any in the world, if not probably better in many ways. Yeah. You know? it, well, yeah. it almost feels like a yeah. pendulum, assuming the pendulum is yeah. the right model. Yeah. It, it's swinging back again. Yeah. Because it, you know, in national identity, Atlantic Canada is known for the kitchen parties and the music yeah. and such. Um, we're we kind so of moved it into the living room. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, you know. <laughs> and, well, and, basement in our case. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we're so dominated by uh, American culture, at least in mass media, yeah. um, that there's no wiggle room for yeah. the next generation of talent to have a venue to, to show its stuff. There's that, a lot of people that, that, that I'll meet, you know, in town, say, just, you know, who, who will... They'll go to some huge American band that comes comes through or some large, you know, and uh, who's playing in Moncton or something. They'll go and stand in the crowd, and you know, and, 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 you know, there's a whole experience there with that, yeah. which I've never totally understood. <laughs> or you could go and hear an equally, probably in many cases, better performance. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily better ours because those ours are very good too, of course. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's just that it's the it's the way they're being presented, you know, and it's it's, it's loud, it's noisy, it's it's crowded, it's it's yep. you know get you get rained on. I mean, you know, you're, you're older now, Paul. I, I guess that's it. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm talking about here. <laughs> no, yeah. no. But, but I, I mean, if you want, if if it's music you want to hear, <laughs> if it, if that's your goal, if that's what you're interested in, then you know, uh, we the, in the Atlantic Province we have some amazing artists. That, yeah. Should be heard, yeah. but but it seems like there's, maybe it's full circle. Maybe a circle is a better analogy than mm. a pendulum, because Atlantic Canada kitchen parties. There's mm. an intimacy to that. Yeah. Um, then the big concert stuff kicks in, inundated with American culture. You know, Anglo's anyway. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of attention to what's going on on E Talk tonight, or yes, that exactly. Sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, in the past twenty years, yeah. there's an awful lot of music happening. Yeah. That hasn't gotten attention. That's their, right. Their platform would be social media. Yeah. Um, but social media is, is, you can't say saturated because it's mm. infinite. Yeah. yeah. But at least you have a way of putting your stuff out there yeah. more than just releasing vinyl or releasing mm. a disc. Um, That's true. Well, yeah, for sure. Spotify now and all, all sorts of. Uh, yeah. And, and some past guests from Tom Swift, a sleepy driver, uh, mm. being on, you know, they, they'll talk about that end of their work. Mm hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And then you come along with these house concerts, mm. which is personal, intimate, mm -hmm. and it's like it's coming full circle. Yeah, no, yeah. No, you don't need to go yeah. through this technology. We need to go back to community. Yeah, again. yeah, yeah. The community is, can support the music. Actually, it's interesting. And as 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 CDs start to phase out, what's left is is live performance. You know, and what is really wonderful is live performance. I don't think there's anything really quite like that. You know, because. What you get on when you have an artist on the stage, you get uh, you get more than just the song. You know, you get the context, the stories, the back line. You get to see the expression on the artist's face. You get to see the energy. You know what I mean? It's 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 just so dynamic seeing live performance, and we really love that. Yeah, absolutely. This is an unfair question, but it's fun to play. Mm. Um, 
not your favorite, but do you have some highlights of some of those house concerts? Mm. Do, you, do you have, you know, oh, this happened, and then the crowd had the hair go up in the back of their neck, or, yeah. or this happened, and this performer had them laughing in their seats between songs. Yeah. Do you have some personal highlights? <laughs> oh, well, there, there's, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was thinking of an artist who, who came and uh, was singing a uh, uh, song about... Um, uh, this was was very interesting. It was an intimate sort of song about uh, uh, the first night that a couple had lived together, and one of the members of the couple passed away. And then uh, this is about the first night that that person was alone. And it happened that in the audience there were several people who were exactly in that situation. So, you know, yeah. So that was. That was a very moving, uh, but he handled it beautifully. You know, I mean, it was so sensitive. It was really, really great, and uh, so that was that type of thing. And then I remember, I remember the night that we had uh, Ron Hines uh, come, probably about five months before he, he died. And uh, in fact, he came two nights. He came. Uh, it was about a week apart. So he did a concert one weekend, and then he went away, and then he came back the next weekend to another one. And we sold them up, both of them. It was Ron Hines, and a lot of people came. And um, it was just a very moving experience to hear, you know, him singing. And I think everybody now is that we're never going to see this guy again. You know, it's just the last concert we're going to see of Ron Hines. And he, I mean, he worked to the last day of his life, practically. You know, so um, anyway, it was a real joy to have him come. And uh, just to, to feel the, the emotion in the room that night, you know. But it's not all sad. I mean, I mean a lot of them are, are very upbeat and uh, sure. voices. Uh, and we have some, uh, you know, one of our, our first artists ever was uh, Ian Sherwood from Halifax. And Ian is all energy, all exciting. Uh, he's, he's just the ultimate consummate performer. And he's come back many times. So when you go to those concerts, you know, it's just, it's fantastic, you know. Yeah, the, most of them are, are very upbeat and yeah. know, like that, you know. Great. Yeah. It's time for us to wrap up. Okay. Any thoughts to send us out? Uh, well, I've enjoyed being here. Great. Thank you for inviting me. I don't have any other thoughts at the moment, I think. But uh, um, but uh, I'm, um, I'm pleased with what's happened in New Brunswick uh, in terms of autism. Uh, I know we got a lot more to go. The one thing we didn't really address is adult services. And uh, that is the area that we're working on quite a lot right now. Um, and uh, I, I think that we, we have a great need in that field. So it's, it's like we have, have this really Cadillac program operating, you know, at the preschool level. And then we have uh, an under construction model going on in the school system, right? And then we have really very little at the level of adult services. So that is where the focus, that's the new frontier. That's, that's where we have to be putting our effort, I think. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we, had a, uh, we had a workshop last uh, September. Uh, Greg McDuff from, uh, was a psychologist from, um, from uh, New Jersey at uh, the Princeton Child Development Institute, and he came and talked for two days about the programs that they operate there for adults, and uh, which are excellent. Uh, we wouldn't be doing what they did necessarily, but it was a good kickstart to the whole, uh, the whole process of looking at adult services and figuring out what do we actually need to have in New Brunswick. Here. But I think we've done creative things at the preschool level and at the school level. We need to do creative things for the adults in our province. And that's going to be a challenge, but I think it's uh, something we can do. Thanks so much for this. You're welcome. My pleasure. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAcheson.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.